Is it just me, or did it seem like the 2000s were full of dog movies? We're in a time where kids like me, born in the 2000s, are now YouTubers and making very nostalgic videos about things we saw growing up. But something I feel I haven't seen many people talk about is all these damn dog movies Disney made. I mean, there are so many. So, today, sit back as we look back into the phenomenon that was dog movies, I guess. So just to get a few things out of the way here, when I say dog movie, I'm talking about movies where the dog was clearly the main character or the entire story revolves around the dog's character. Also, this is purely talking about the live action movies, mainly ones where they had voices with a few exceptions. So no Scooby Doo. Sorry guys. So to get started, I figured I'd go down memory lane and talk about some of the most memorable movies before breaking down the history behind them, how it became a studio favorite, and what propelled them even more into the mainstream in the 2000s. So let's start with the most popular franchise in this genre, the Buddy Films. This franchise has 14 movies under its belt, and it's just our first example. Starting way back in 1990, a man named Kevin DeChico and his golden retriever Buddy won America's Funniest Home Video and David Letterman's Stupid Pet Tricks. He then went on to Keystone Entertainment to get the original Air Bud movie produced. That's when Disney stepped in and saw an opportunity to monetize. After the sequel in 1998, they fully took over and started pumping out these spin-off movies. Disney pushed 12 of these movies out in the span of 13 years. All of these movies centered around the same idea, it would be Bud, the dog, playing different sports and getting into some usual mischief. Although Disney made the very smart idea to start using younger dogs to really capture that heartwarming feeling, I mean, how could you turn this down? They came out with three more movies from 2000 to 2003, when they took a slight hiatus. Wondering how they would continue the story, they came back in 2006 with the revolutionary Air Buddies. This is the movie that changed the series into the nearly $300 million empire it's become today. The other huge piece of this movie was Now the Dogs Talk. This would be an absolute smash hit. While there aren't disclosed specific sales for the individual films, the total amount the franchise has grossed so far is over $220 million. It's Disney's second biggest straight-to-DVD franchise behind Disney Fairies. It's also theorized that the mouth animations made an impact, because just two years after the first Air Buddies movie, Disney came out with another massive talking dog franchise, Beverly Hills Chihuahua. We all remember, and love, and kinda hate, the George Lopez backed Beverly Hills Chihuahua, which was almost called South of the Border. Over 200 dogs were cast to appear in the movie, including almost 50 Chihuahuas. Most of the extra dogs were actually rescued and found forever homes after, which is actually really cool for a company like Disney. Much of the film was shot on location in Mexico, with even several Beverly Hills locations being filmed in Puerto Vallarta. Unlike Air Bud, where a single dog who was trained his whole life happened to make a movie, Beverly Hills Chihuahua was conceived before any dogs were found. The second film in the series was released three years later in 2011, with the last one being released coincidentally one year later in 2012. Even after creating an $127 million franchise again right in the early 2010s, Disney stopped producing the series and we never heard about it again. There was some talk about an animated series coming to Disney Junior, but it never fully developed beyond a pilot episode. Now while Disney arguably pioneered this genre, like everything that pops off, other big companies are gonna copy it. Let's move our eyes to 20th Century Fox and Owen Wilson who starred in two huge movies in this genre. And I'll start with the big one you're all waiting for, the 2008 film Marley and Me. This movie was huge, and still is. It set and still holds the record for being the largest gross Christmas Day opening box office movie, making $14.75 million opening day in over $270 million total. Although it still gets pretty mid-reviews based on some of the largest sites, while very basic yes, we can't deny that Owen Wilson and Jennifer Aniston led this movie to have a huge impact on the genre. I like to think that this was a peak for the genre, with Beverly Hills Chihuahua coming out the same year and the Buddies film cranking out their second film, it really seemed these were especially everywhere right now. Especially as a little 8-12 to 12 year old kid like myself during these years, it always felt like Disney was playing these movies on TV every weekend, and Marley and Me videos were all over the internet. Without a breakout movie like that, they were quick to develop a follow up, something I didn't even know about for years, and the reason why is because it was also a straight to DVD movie with puppies that, you guessed it, talk. 
pretty much everything about this movie is a buddy's ripoff. It's actually sad because the first movie was based on a book by the same name written by a man named John Grogan and it really resonated with many people. While the sequel is just very obviously a money grab, knowing parents will buy this in any local DVD store for their kids when they see it and start flipping out, and the worst part is Owen Wilson wasn't even in it. It had a no name cast, no offense, and it's just really bad, I'm sorry. <laughs> But don't be too sad, because Owen Wilson would rebound right back as a dog's best friend in the 20th Century Fox's other breakout talking dog movie, Marmaduke. By this time, like I had said, the genre has started to die off. While during its first week, Marmaduke did very well, earning $3.4 million opening day. But within its second week, sales declined 48%. Critics were not easy on the movie either. Rotten Tomatoes has an average score of 3.3 out of 10. The website's critical consensus reads, Dull and unfunny, Marmaduke offers family filmgoers little more than another round of talking animals and scatological humor. Which wasn't totally wrong. If you watch the movie, especially now as an adult, it's very easy to get lost. And not because the story is confusing. I mean lost in your head. Like just straight up zone out. It very quickly becomes easy back background noise as there's not much to pay attention to. Even with all that, Marmaduke was nominated at the Teen Choice Awards for Choice Movie Animated. George Lopez was nominated for a Razzie Award for Worst Supporting Actor in his role in Marmaduke, which I did not even know existed. It did also get an animated reboot on Netflix starring Pete Davidson as the voice of Marmaduke, but again, I didn't even know this existed until researching the original movie, so it must not have made waves. But now it's time to talk about one of the most classic franchises we have in this video, and while the dog doesn't talk, it would feel sacrilegious to do a video about dog movies and not mention Beethoven. Whoa, I told you there are a lot of dog movies, huh? And that's not even close to all of them. So I figured to everyone still watching, I'd give your brain a short little break from a bunch of pretty useless but intriguing information. But uh, for real, I wanted to just stop for a moment and just give a huge thanks for helping me get to 500 subs. Uh, YouTube is just like been a dream fantasy of mine since I was a kid. And the fact that I reached this milestone is just like, it, it's like really cool and emotional for me. And it is hard for me to talk about emotional things like this, but it just gives me that warm, tingly feeling to my core. And it makes me so excited to keep producing content and making it better and better and better for you each time you watch it. And I really, I just really cannot put into words how grateful I am for just this experience. Thank you so much. Now that your brain is in serious mode, let's bring it back to some funny doggy videos. So, like I was saying, it wouldn't be a video about dog movies without mentioning the mega franchise that is Beethoven. Starting way back in 1992, the first two movies were actually released in theaters too, doing pretty well. The original Beethoven was released in theaters in, in April 1992. It was the year's 26th largest grossing film in the US at the time, making a cool 57 million. The second movie, Beethoven's Second, was released the following year in 1993. The first two movies starred the same dog, Chris, who was over 200 pounds. Sadly, he did pass away in 2015. It was hard to find a lot of information on the background of the dog and their trainers and owners, unlike most of the other movies on this list, but then again it was the very early 90s and I'm sure animal rights weren't as prevalent as they have become today. But I did find an article talking about Chris's passing posted by CBS where they did manage to get a quote from one of the original trainers who said Chris did enjoy a happy retirement, so that's good. But back to the franchise, the movies took a bit of a hiatus, but in 1994, in true dog movie fashion, they made an animated series in Beethoven Talk. Also, Nicole Tom, who played the teenage daughter in Beethoven Second, actually did the voice for her character too, which is pretty cool. It aired on CBS Saturday mornings for one season, only 13 episodes, but Beethoven was still a huge success and it wanted to keep its presence. It quickly came out with a line of toys following the release of the first movie, and in 1993 it even got a side-scrolling video game called Beethoven The Canine Capers, which was released on the SNES and Game Boy. There's also a version of that game that was supposed to be released for the Sega Genesis and the Sega Game Gear, which was said to be fully completed but never released which would be a pretty fun piece of lost media for somebody to find. But finally, in 2000, they came back with Beethoven's 3rd. Between 2000 and 2003, they had come out with Beethoven's 3rd, 4th, and 5th. All movies are in the original storyline with the same characters and family. But in 2008, they came out with Beethoven's Big Break, which is the movie I grew up with. Though they never went into it with the idea of it being a reboot, it pretty much was, because it disregards the entire storyline of the original 5 films. But it has Rico from Hannah Montana, and that's pretty cool to me. 
You know, as I'm writing the script, I'm just realizing that the Beethoven films are kind of interesting in the fact that they are not interesting. I mean, every movie has a different plot, but at the end of the day, it's a Beethoven movie. I mean, there's a stressed out older man, chaotic dog, an excited kid, and some sort of antagonist. And also, he never talks, so what's up with that? No, but Beethoven is a huge classic, and there's no doubt that it was a huge factor into what propelled these movies into a mainstream spot. And just like being one of the first in the genre, it was one of the last, with the last film, Beethoven's Treasure Tale, being released on October 28th, 2014. It's almost a little sad looking back seeing something, a new idea, come to fruition and do so well, and lots of us have our own connections with them, and now they're just gone, and pretty soon we'll be the old people talking about movies that we grew up with. Except I'm already doing that. The talking dog movies were really their own special niche. It's no doubt that the success of Beethoven and Airbud were the initial factors for production companies to go, hmm, okay, I think we're onto something here. The other major thing in play here is the rise of CGI. Computer generated imagery goes all the way back to the 60s, and it quickly grew from there. While there are a lot of examples of CGI being used in movies throughout history, something in the 90s really just made it stand out and become normal. With it being used in movies like Terminator 2, The Magic, Jurassic Park, and Toy Story. Oh yeah, Toy Story was a groundbreaking innovation for CGI, and that movie did uh, quite well to say the least. And what that did was open Disney's big brain to making animals talk in movies. It would be like a real life cartoon, and they were meant for kids who wouldn't know the difference anyway. It would give kids the sparkle and the magic of believing maybe they could talk to their animals, or that they could have their own lives when they're not around, like Toy Story. It's really interesting to pick apart the logic and philosophies that go into stuff like this because it really is similar in a lot of things. Taking something mundane and making it magical is Disney's specialty and they nail it time and time again. And just like some old toys or your family pets, it's fun to think that maybe they really are up to stuff when we're not around. And finally, it's much cheaper to freelance dogs for most of a day than hiring actors to contracts. While there are some reports of doggy actors making up to $2,300 a day on set, with how long it takes to film a movie and things like residuals, it's much cheaper for studios in the long run. And you could argue they're harder to work with, but with the stories you hear nowadays of celebrities, I don't know about that. And that's just about all I have today. Looking back, it's just another example of a pop culture phase. We saw a new idea rise to extreme prominence, get absolutely saturated with all sorts of movies, and just slowly died off. But that doesn't mean our connections with these films are dumb or any less meaningful than anything else. I'll always remember these films, and hey, maybe one day I'll force my kid to watch them. And you guys are not forced to watch this, but I really appreciate everyone who does. Seriously. Thank you for 500 subs. Make sure to like, comment, and keep subbing to raise those numbers. And I will see you all in the next video.